spacious place for our time of worship, where we are fed from the Word of God, refreshed by the Spirit of God in prayer and song, and restored by the living, loving, and welcoming presence of God in each other. We gather around this table and in our sanctuary where all are welcome. Let us join together and sing for the beauty of the earth. Its voice was united number 226.
quite annoying to Saul, actually. And he said one time, money should never be an incentive for doing a job and doing it well. I didn't say it at the time, because I was 20-something. I, I needed my job. <laughs> I didn't want to lose my job. I wanted to keep it. But today, I would like to say, really? Well, if it weren't for the money, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> With that, let us listen for the good news in Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idly in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. And when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. In this reading, it's good news for God's people. Amen. And the Spirit of the living God be with us today. Amen. Loving, <clears throat> well, gracious God, we want to set and heard be in the spirit of you, our living God. Amen. Further to my opening comments about this scripture is a remark I have made a few times to various people about a line from the uh, Jordan Davis Luke Bryan song, By Dirt. You ever heard that song? If you haven't, you better listen to it. It's a great song, By Dirt. The line is, one of the lines from the chorus, do what you love, but call it work. I hate to admit it, but that manager who I was talking about who said money should never be an incentive for doing a good job was sort of right. I have for the last 23 years now been doing what I love and calling it work. Well, not work, but ministry. And I get a fair wage for doing it. Whether it takes 80 hours or 40 hours or 60 hours in a week to get the work done is of no consequence. I do what I need to do to do what I'm called to do. So we've got this parable today about work and money. Parables always have multiple layers to them. On the surface, this lesson is that life is not fair. And those who come late to a job are as worthy as those who've been at it their whole life. The justice concern is that all receive a daily wage to meet their daily needs. That's one of the big concerns going on in our country to this day. Lots of talk about a living wage. People that are making such a low hour, dollar per hour, that they, they can't, it's not enough for, for their daily needs. 
just their needs. Nothing else, just their needs. One of the workers who worked all day complains that those who only worked one hour were made equal. The landowner in turn reminds the worker that he's allowed to do what he wants with what belongs to him and questions if the worker is jealous of his generosity. <coughs> At a deeper level, perhaps this parable is to explore what it means to be generous or what it means to understand there's enough for everyone. The systems of the world work to pit workers against one another and it becomes an us versus them scenario. But God shows us that there is enough for everyone. And in the parable, this householder hires his laborers for his vineyard several times through the course of the day and ultimately compensates them all with that typical daily wage. So they all get that living wage. Paying the latest arrivals first. So we get this consternation among the early arrivers which is expressed in the gospel as grumbling. Not that they ought to be paid more, but rather that the late arrivers ought to be paid less. You have made them equal to us, they say. And the landowner basically says to the grumblers, well, that's kind of the idea. I am generous, just as God is generous. And in the eyes of God, we are all equal. You can read into that, the kingdom of heaven is filled with equal treatment for all. There is no us and them in heaven. There's a work and reward ethos kind of underpinning this complaint from the grum grumblers. <clears throat> Strictly speaking, the early arrivers don't envy the late arrivers. 
Envy means wishing to possess something someone else has. Rather, what we have here is the opposite. Wishing someone else didn't have something you've already received. Indeed, the early writers are neither envious nor obsessed with fairness. They're just being scornful. They've judged the later writers to be less worthy, and they resent the householder's action because it erases that imagined pecking order. You have made them equal to us. Put simply, when the early writers look at the later writers, they see a them to look down on. The householder, God, Jesus, will have none of this. The NRSV translates his response as, are you envious? But actually the Greek is literally, is your eye evil? I don't know where you get that translation, but that's, that's what it is. Is your eye evil? Jesus uses the term evil eye in the Sermon on the Mount. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, literally, if your eye is evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So the problem with the early arrivers has to do with how they see, or rather fail to see, the world around them. Where they could and should see a we, they see an us versus them. Where they couldn't see, feel camaraderie, they feel contempt. Where they could and should see and celebrate a vineyard of God's grace, they see an arena of competition and a cause for resentment. Doesn't that sound a lot like our current world? An arena of competition and a cause for resentment. In short, their eye is unhealthy. Their whole way of seeing the world is distorted and obscured. Their lamp of the body is emitting darkness, not light. And so their whole body fills with darkness. Even the household of generosity itself, the very abundance of which the early arrivers also are beneficiaries, is twisted into an occasion for division and scorn for the invention of a them for us to look down on. So what are we with healthy eyes to do with Jesus' parable? Jesus' use of the evil eye idiom puts a new spin on his declaration that you are the light of the world. We're called to see creation through the householder's eyes as a, a vineyard full of hard work, yes, and at the same time full of God's graceful gifts. Even hard work is a gift. And then, once we see in this way, we're called to act accordingly, becoming lamps that illumine the world of blessing for all to see. Can we see creation in this way? As a part as a, a garden of God's generosity. Despite how things often seem, despite the drumbeats of scarcity, threat, the work of reward, like most things involving turning the world back upright, it's easier said than done. Not only because those drumbeats are compelling and familiar, or because the world is so full of loss and suffering, or because our lives, especially these days, are so besieged by various forms of us versus them. Seeing the world as a graceful garden and acting accordingly takes profound trust and patience and insight and imagination. It's just plain difficult and hard work. And we need each other's help to do it, which is what the church is or should be at its best and also God's help, most of all. But when we do see it in this way, when the lamp of our eyes are illuminated, 
the wounds of creation will begin to heal. And there is a lot of that going on. Especially a lot of the demonstrations and protests about climate change and creation in our world. You know, there's that lamps of people's eyes that are saying, we've got to do something about this. We've got to change our way of being or our, our Earth's going to go burn up. When we see each other as fellow, fellow, fellow beneficiaries of God's merciful gifts, equally unentitled and equally beloved, the whole idea of us versus them begins to fall away. The report that you have made them equal to us becomes a cause for delight, celebration, not complaint. And what emerges in the end is an ever-widening we, children of God in the image of God, the one who turns the world right side up, humbling the first and lifting up the last. To Jesus Christ, you knew us and loved us before we were, who loves us now and will love us forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs> Philippians 1, verse 2 encourages us to live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel. May we live generous lives that reflect the fullness of the gospel, unity of the spirit, and faith in our God and in God's church. We give you thanks for your ongoing support of our churches and also for those who support the Mission and Service Fund of the United Church of Canada. <clears throat> in today's Mission and Service story is entitled Listening and Learning on the Past Reconciliation. <clears throat> when Alf Dumont's Roman Catholic father and Anishinaabe mother asked the priest serving the Shawanaga reserved to marry them, the priest rejected their request, advising them to marry someone of their own kind. Nearby, the United Church minister had a different response. He told the couple he had just two rules. If you have differences, talk them out and just try to get along. Good rules for all of us, right? Dad and mom said, I think we can do that. They brought together First Nations understanding and non-First Nations understanding. That's how I came to the church, Dumont recounts in a United in Learning webinar. Dumont spent his life as a spiritual leader serving the United Church as a minister while staying connected with his traditional indigenous spirituality. His memoir, The Other Side of the River, From Church Pew to Sweat Lodge, shares stories of how Dumont walks between the two worlds of indigenous and settler, traditional spirituality and Christianity. Part of the struggle with me in life was to find out who I was as Anishinaabe and who I was as French, Irish, and English mix, Dumont shares. With a foot in both sides of the river, Dumont's words eloquently draw together spiritual threads. There are seven truths in some of the Anishinaabe teaching. Love, courage, respect, humility, truth, wisdom, and honesty. But you can't have one of those teachings or truths without having the others. So you can't have respect without love. You can't have truth without humility, explains Dumont. I took those underlying teachings and applied them to the four teachings on love. Love God, love your neighbor, love your enemy, and love yourself. You can't have one teaching without the other. You can't love God if you don't truly love yourself. You cannot love your neighbor unless you truly love God. 
In an interview, Broadview Magazine asked Dumont to weigh in on the future of reconciliation. Part of the struggle has to do with learning to walk together again. It means being as open as we can, he says. You bring a gift that I don't have, I bring a gift that you may not have. And as we share, we learn from the gifts that we have been given. Your gifts, your mission, and service help support the creation and publication of luminous, timely work like Dumont's book, as well as the webinar discussions and education events that follow. Through listening and learning, we take important steps forward on the journey toward reconciliation. We thank God for that story for this day. Let us join together and sing our offertory, What Can I Do?
Our communion liturgy is printed in your bulletin. I invite you to join in where it is printed in larger and more printed. The Holy One be with you. With you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to the one who guides our life together. It is our joy, our gratitude, and praise. God, you never promised us that the way would be clear. You have, however, created us in your image, the image of one who is wisdom, who is love, who is courage. You breathed your life into us with the assurance that we have within and around us everything we need to be your faithful people. Though we sometimes act in disregard for your call on our collective life, still you show up with and for us relentlessly. And so we join with all the saints who have gone before in gratitude for your abiding presence. Holy, holy, holy one, God of power and presence, all that is, is full of your glory. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of love. Sacred is your presence, and blessed is Christ with us. Through the life of Jesus, we saw an example of what it means to navigate an uncertain path, practice creative ministry, and face with courage and compassion all the barriers that work against your spirit on the move. Jesus lived and breathed a ministry rooted in your love for all people. He prioritized the lives of those who were suffering, and showed us what it looks like to be with and for one another, even under great distress. Though evil attempted to silence his proclamation of an all-inclusive kingdom of God, not even death could keep love from growing. On the night in which he was arrested, he gathered among friends for a meal. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread and shared it with his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of Christ with us, in the assurance of your love persistent, we offer our lives, our ministries, and our church in the service of your healing work as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your spirit on this community and these gifts. Make them a taste of your kingdom through Christ with us, that we might leave the table most nourished by your love and still hungry for justice for all people. We hold in our prayers this day those who are ill of mind, body, or spirit. Those who are in care facility. Those who may be at the even tide of life. And those who are mourning the loss of life within their midst. May your healing touch God rest and abide with them, and may they know how much they are loved and cared for. We also hold in our prayers the many who are suffering in some way around our world. Through so many natural and unnatural disasters. Praying for peace to come to the valley. Praying for justice to be served wherever it needs to be served. Praying for ongoing love and care of those who are in disaster zones. May we continue to always be mindful of our good lives and those whose lives are not as good. Holding them up in our prayers, we bring to our prayers this day the words that Jesus taught us to pray as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as 
we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we remember from the Gospel account that Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, enjoying a meal. And he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it. And he said to them, this is my body, this is as my body which will be broken for you. Each time you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is broken for you and me. In like manner, he took the chalice of wine that they had been passing around, gave thanks to God, held it before his disciples' eyes and said to them, this is the blood of the new covenant, which will be written in my blood. This is the new covenant, which will be written in my blood. Each time you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me.
And may our eternal God, Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit go with each and every one of you this day, now, and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>